Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Phil Reed podcast. Today on my sofa, I have a young gentleman who is a very, very interesting guy. And I met this guy probably about a month ago, maybe five, six weeks ago. Uh, we had a very, very brief chat. Um, and I thought he has to come on my podcast for a number of reasons. And you'll find out why I was so adamant to to have Mo on. Um, Mo, I'd love it if you could give yourself an intro. We'll get straight into it after that. Sure. But yeah, go for it. Sure. Well, Phil, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. For anyone watching at home, there's two sides to me that you need to know about. By day, aerospace engineer. Uh, I'm the aerodrome system specialist for Heathrow Airport. So if you've ever flown out of Heathrow Airport, I've had an impact on your life yeah. in some way, shape or form. Yeah. You've just never known it. I look after the runways. I look after all the taxiways, all the systems, all the electronics that actually makes that stuff work. I do all of that. I look after all of that, make sure that it's working, reliable, and it's pumping lights on as as we expect. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then by night, um, I'm a motivational speaker. I go into corporate companies, schools, youth clubs, talking to people about mindset, talking to people about how they can optimize sort of their approach, I guess, to life. Yep. Um, and really, the, ultimately, the bottom line is how can you how can you become more than who you currently are? What sort mm. of stuff do you have to do to try and take your own self to the next level? And that really stems from a, a, a journey that I went through. Mm. And when you kind of look on your own your life, you're like, shit, within six months, I feel like a different person. Yeah. You realize that everyone can go through that. And you're kind of just like driven to want to do that. Yeah. And then I also make social media content. I uh, I do TikTok videos, Instagram videos about the airport. I love educating people about the airport, uh, about what happens at the airport. Yeah. It's such a world that people don't really know about. And yeah, put that on TikTok, put that on Instagram, and people seem to enjoy it. So people, people, do, people more than enjoy it. People, <laughs> people absolutely love it. And I'm one of those people. Like, you've got to go check out Mo on Instagram because um, and YouTube as well. But your Instagram is is full. Oh, TikTok as well, I guess is TikTok, probably, yeah. probably your main channel, uh, page, it's social one, yeah. page. It's full of fascinating, detailed examples of what happens at the airport why things work the way they do about everything about Heathrow right mm -hmm. and it's it genuinely is a behind the scenes look um which we've never I don't think you really get there might be the odd tv show about you know traveling like Heathrow airport and stuff like that but um it's often more about angry passengers that have missed flights <laughs> on tv what you give is a new perspective and it's heavily engineering led but also you you deliver and explain things in a way that is just so simple. Layman's terms for everybody, right? That's it. And I love that. Yeah. So we've got to talk about that. Absolutely. We have to talk about your, your social stuff as well. Um, and yeah, I, th I guess your, your earlier years as well, if that's good. Uh, basically just your journey to where you are now. So um, I hope you guys now understand why I wanted to get Mo on. Um, fascinating guy. So, 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 so. Your younger years then. Mm -hmm. So... London, born, bred, born and raised in London. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was born in Chelsea, Westminster Hospital. Were you moved into Kensington? That's where I spent the first like two years of my life. Yeah, yeah. Little council flat in Kensington. Then I moved out to a council house in Wilsdon, which is just a little bit further out. Yeah. So literally, I just I went more and more northwest every yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I'm somewhere near Wembley. Fair. Um, but born and raised there, man. Um, grew up. Grew up on a on a council estate basically my whole life, um, or council housing I should say. Yeah. So very 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 sort of humble roots, and that's something I take much pride in. Yeah. A lot of pride in, and I think that's something that I hold on to quite daily. And then, really shy, really insecure, wouldn't make a wouldn't make a noise, mm. bend over backwards to fit into trends. Yeah. Never ever made people realize that like you know when you're a nerd. Mm. but you don't want other people to think you're a nerd yeah so they talk about football you talk about football that's how it works they talk yeah. about celebrities you talk about celebrities yeah. everyone's singing along to this tune this this song that you've never heard of you go home you do your research yeah and all of that just to try and fit in um i worked hard to try and do i remember i used to like tell people i support manchester united didn't care about football yeah. at all but i used to go home and research 11 players just in case somebody ever asked yeah. me um and I guess the reason why I mentioned that is because there was a turning point later on in life that when I was over, able to overcome that insecurity of understanding who I was, that's when this whole thing kicked off. Like when I was able to openly say, I love physics, maths and planes, mm. 
when that when I was able to like get the guts to actually say that my life changed mm-hmm. because instantly you you realize that there's so many other people like your community your tribe mm-hmm. are the people who care about that yeah. but your whole life you're surrounding yourself with people who actually don't care about the stuff you care about mm-hmm. and that's very limiting very interesting because you said you said a lot that I can relate to and I'm guessing most young children adults even young adults now will try to conform with what is perceived to be normal and that often is talking about football going to the pub and having drinks with your mates and having all this banter and and stuff and especially when you're young you feel like you need to fit in and Mm. to to do that you just go with the flow and you yeah you can you conform and it's interesting that you say one day that you just changed was there was there a specific thing that happened was there a trigger point for you was 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 it a conversation with someone what what was it that made you just change it was a conversation uh and it actually was i was telling you earlier that i pray i used to play american football at uni yeah so american football introduced me to a whole bunch of people that i would have actually never really crossed paths with but there was one guy in particular who just absolutely did not care Mm. about what anyone thought about him like he was just so truly being authentic to himself and he'd make a fool of himself. Mm. But what I realized is that, I mean, you're in this macho environment, you know, big built guys, you know, everyone's like, it's an aggressive sport. You know, you gotta be the man, right? This guy wasn't even that tall, quite skinny, yeah. but his confidence, yeah, just his sheer confidence of who he was yeah. and what he stood for and what he cared about. He didn't care about anything anyone thought about him. Mm-hmm. And I realized that he was so respected in that community because he was confident about yeah. who he was. Yeah, fair. And he never like if he didn't if he didn't care about something, he'd say it. If he didn't like something, he'd say it. Mm. And I remember I sat down with him once and I was talking to him. And he was explaining to me like his mindset and like his approach to the world. And I was just completely blown away that somebody could actually think about the world that way. Yeah. Nobody ever ever spoken about the world and like he was telling me about growth mindset, telling me about confidence, self-assuredness, like being comfortable in your own skin in a way that I'd never heard anyone speak about it before. Yeah. And I was like, shit, like, where did you learn this stuff? Yeah. Like, where did you bring this stuff? Like, how, mm. how have I never heard anyone say this? Mm. And he was like, yeah, you should read this book. It's got, it's got a bunch of stuff in there. Oh yeah. It was, uh, it's called the USA guide to balance. Okay. And it's mind, body, and soul it talks about your mind, talks about your body and your soul uh, and how to sort of align it all. It is it, very spiritual, sort of chakras type stuff that's the mind and the body stuff i only ever read sorry the body and the soul stuff i only ever read the mind and then i went off on a massive tangent into mindset yeah yeah i can imagine yeah yeah Yeah. but that's kind of like my switching point is watching one other person who was so freely being themselves yeah it's like it's like i craved it and i wanted to i wanted i went on a journey to seek that fair play to you that you had i guess you had some sort of confidence at that point to actually go after what you wanted i can imagine there's a lot of people that will see others that are exactly how they think they should be and mm-hmm. how they want to be but still just maybe don't have the tools or uh confidence to change like that mm. because you're right you probably had the mindset of just being like i'm gonna flip the switch and i'm i'm gonna be who i want to be it's probably a lot of people do you know there's a lot of people in life that will, will have a career that they just hate and they just do it because they have you know responsibilities they've got to pay bills and they just never do what they truly like or um that is i guess a shell of who they really are and it's mm. it's interesting you could do that so quickly maybe it wasn't as quick as you've made it sound like yeah. but um and ad- any advice for someone that is maybe younger you know at, at the age that you were for someone that is struggling to find what it is i guess who they truly are or but maybe just to be more confident in themselves all that kind of stuff what, what would you what would you say apart from this book that you read yeah, yeah. um it's always hard to try and give somebody one piece of advice mm. but my biggest the biggest thing that changed my life was the fact that i started to learn about the human mind yeah like neuroplasticity mm. the growth mindset mm. and what you realize is that everyone who everything that you thought you were can change mm. it's that Yes, that's interesting. That's the thing that changes yeah. you. It's not that you, you as much as you discover who you are, mm. it's that you realize that who you are can change. Yeah. Because everything that you were, yeah. you might not want to be. You, yeah. 
that you, so much sense because I have to come back to me to give an example maybe that you can share one with me as well. I thought I was the Canary Wharf banker that would wear a suit and have a briefcase and was like, rah, 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 I'm so, I'm the boss, whatever. (laughs) Yeah. I thought that's what I was. I didn't think I was the social media content creator, you know, that kind of guy. Yeah. And I did have that switch as well. And I was like, why not? Because I did used to think like, I'm just not that guy. Exactly. And it's so bizarre. It's like, but it says who? Like, exactly. it says you. Exactly. And that's the biggest limiting factor. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you for putting words to what I've always yeah. thought and the change I had. But very, very interesting. Very interesting. So you went to uni mm-hmm. and you studied aerospace engineering. So you're probably one of the smartest people that I've ever spoken <laughs> to. Nah, what A levels did you get? This will confirm what, it. What, what did I do at A-levels? Um, yeah, what did and you... And what, what I got. Yeah. Um, Let me guess. Physics, maths, further maths. And you probably did AS, chemistry. <laughs> did you do it? Was that it? Was that it? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, let me guess your grades. Let me guess your grades. Okay. Here's the bit where you're going to get underwhelmed. <laughs> okay, now you've said that. I'll use that information to my advantage. You got... I know the uni you went to as well. So you got... A A two, so you got A A B. Oh, A B B. Yeah, A B B. Man, you were you were good. <laughs> Damn, I was close. I was close. Yeah, maths, so, further maths, physics, and chemistry <laughs> is my A levels. So I mean, good, good, great. They are good grades. We we yeah. obviously know people that get A stars, right? But the the subjects you chose were like incredibly difficult. So yeah. you did well. They said choose something for your fourth subject that you might enjoy, and I chose further maths. <laughs> yeah and yeah. i actually did really enjoy it which is like the type of nerd that i am is that what you gotta, love you gotta be maths. in further maths yeah. yeah okay yeah is it is it the hardest subject at a level further maths no man physics. i loved it physics like, hardest. I, chemistry was there was so much content to learn yeah but further maths was fun yeah i don't know about you and i've spoken to other people who've done further maths <laughs> further maths was enjoyable really genuinely like i used to look forward to further maths i'm the like i'm a nerd You're deep a nerd. down yeah yeah, yeah. I'm not as, uh, I'm a bit of a nerd. I just like learning how things work. You studied aerospace. Yeah, but you can still, I'm still on TikTok doing yeah. videos. About, about what? <laughs> about, yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's, you have to embrace it. Yeah, I love it. But I there's always it. two sides to me. Like, yeah, I have one, I have the side of me that loves the planes and stuff like that, but I have, I have so many different sides. Yeah. I think I like, I embr- I've started to embrace that about myself. Yeah. Like, I enjoy a bit of this, a bit of hey, that. Blah, blah, blah. I, I, but I consider myself a bit nerdy because I like, I like Pokemon. Yeah. Which, is it nerdy? Uh, who, 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 who are we to say it's nerdy, right? Um, you, you're a smart guy, but yeah, you went to Brunel Uni, studied aerospace. Mm-hmm. Do you say aerospace engineering? That's right, yeah, aerospace engineering. Plumbing heck. <laughs> that sounds so intense. It's really hard. It sounds <laughs> so intense. If you're considering doing aerospace engineering, just know there's a lot of maths and it's quite hard. <laughs> Damn. But I'd say it's probably up there with like medicine in terms of difficulty of a, really? of a degree. Like there comes days where it's hard, like you, like there's so much content and my lecturer didn't give us a formula sheet in the exam. So he made us remember all, all the formulas for aerothermodynamics yeah. in third year of uni, where you're literally combining first, second, yeah, and third all, all year all, all into one. And there are these long equations to calculate like yeah, the pressure within the chamber that's like the combustion chamber of a jet engine. And it's like you have to go three steps forward and four steps back to try and find the. Could you not? Could you not write all the formulas on your hand and like <laughs> it put it in your calculator? <laughs> no, I'm joking. My friend, my it's seven pages worth of formulas. That's yeah, mad. that's mad. My friend tried to like <laughs> just. Oh yeah. Yeah, he went to the toilet once and he came back and he just gave me that look. When he, came <laughs> back, he came back into the exam hall like, bro, like, this nah, was, I'm, I'm done. This this, this isn't gonna, gonna work. work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually did that in my in my chemistry exam. You know the um, what they call the mathematical calculators. Yeah. You know the ones where you have A B C. You have the lettering, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you could you could write in formulas and mm-hmm. you could kind of save it. And you just press it. Yeah. yeah, I did that. I also played the um, I'm sick card at school, so I might need to go to the toilet at any point. Put a piece of paper down my sock. Went to the toilet. Read it. Kind of helped for me. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I did everything, man. Just just to just get, to get a, by. a slight advantage <laughs> yeah. and, to, and to get by. Um, but very very interesting mm-hmm. that that you're well that you studied that it was a, I guess the the better thing is that it was a three year degree not a seven with medicine yeah so that's something. that's a life sentence so that's I, <laughs> seven years 
Yeah. Isn't that To actually mad? become a doctor. And then you come out on 24K that's, as a junior doctor or something like that. That's an interesting conversation. How the most difficult, one of the most difficult degrees and the most stressful job you can have, arguably, you get paid bang average, below average, maybe not below, but you know what I mean? Like silly, silly low price. Yeah. Or not price, but a salary. Yeah. And then you look at... um. I went, I went on a, in on 27, I think. Yeah. Um, I, it was a DOS for me. Yeah. Like it, it was, it was so You had easy. so much free time and started making videos. It, <laughs> I, it's, it, it's true. But like you, I had a night version of me. Right? <laughs> that I'm yeah, playing. Yeah, you, know, you, know, you know, you know, you know. I know how it feels. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just... But yeah, you know, you're right. Um, is, is the, is the grad salary good for an aerospace engineer? pretty pretty much the same yeah yeah like you come out 20 27 8 some of that and then when you when you come out on the other side it just goes up yeah it's way better yeah it's funny yeah um i think i think the most you can get as a grad is is an investment banker i think Mm -hmm. i think it's around 50 Mm. for most of the banks but they do they do have to work pretty damn hard long hours pretty damn long hours yeah yeah Okay, so now your current job. Mm-hmm. What what is your what is your job title and I guess the description of what you do day to day? Yeah. So my job title is the Aerodrome System Specialist for Heathrow Airport. Sounds so cool. Which sounds so sick. <laughs> it does. It really does. <laughs> uh, great to have on my CV moving forward. Um, but basically, what I do is well, let's break it down. Yeah. Aerodrome Systems Specialist. What is the aerodrome? Mm. The aerodrome is everything you see when you look outside of a terminal building. So when you're at the airport and you look out the terminal building, the place where the plane is parked up, yeah. the the roads, so to speak, the planes maneuver to actually get to the runways. Yeah. That's part of the aerodrome. And then the runways themselves. Yeah. That's all considered the aerodrome. So it's the place where planes can maneuver at an airport outside of a building. Yeah. And then within that space, there are systems. So this, as a system specialist, there are systems within that space, okay. such as the lights on the ground, the control system that sits up the control tower so that people can control those lights. Okay. Uh, you have all the electrical equipment that plugs into the plane when it stands at the gate. And you also have like the laser guided parking sensors that actually park a plane up. So a part, you don't, you know, before there was like, that somebody doing this, yeah, doing this, go a little bit left. We don't do that at Heathrow Airport. We really? have such a huge turnaround of planes. We have this really smart gray box that you'll probably see dotted around if you ever look outside of a terminal building Inside it, there's there's a laser and two mirrors. And what it'll, you have to put into it, you say, okay, I'm this plane is about to come park up. It knows what that plane looks like. So it will keep scanning that stand until wow. it sees the nose and it sees the engines and it sees the landing gear. And it's like, okay, well, I know exactly where this plane should be. And then it starts to display on a screen, uh, basically like, okay, you need to go a little bit left, yeah. a little bit right. And so it's bang on the line. And then it'll give a countdown to the pilots as to when they need to stop so that the air bridges can be lined up nice and perfectly. So wow. all of these systems that are on the aerodrome, I'm the system specialist for them. So I'm the subject matter expert technically within the, the team where if things go wrong, I lead investigations to understand what's happening, write the reports, I yeah. write the maintenance. So um, how can we maintain these assets to make sure that they're yeah. working as efficiently as possible? Because one little thing falls over has such a massive knock-on effect at the airport. Yeah. So you always have to try and minimize how many things fall over at yeah. all times, make sure there's contingency. So for all these systems, I'm basically there looking into the past, the present and the future, any yeah. future projects of what's coming in the pipeline yeah. that we need to prepare ourselves for, past, present and future of these systems to make sure everything's flowing nice and smoothly. That's it. You said it very well. <laughs> Summed it up. Yeah. Can um, you picture it? That's the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, completely. I mean, I was at an airport... Um, three days ago nice. and i was looking around and i was thinking it's the world I, I wonder what i wonder what mo does i wonder what does he i wonder if he controls this i wonder if he knows more <laughs> about this so i've got a bunch of questions like loads of questions but the first thing i want to ask and it relates to your job as a traveler being at an airport yeah. can be s- the most <clears throat> stressful thing right traveling yeah. through an airport and security working in an airport mm-hmm. is it the same and do you ever feel the pressure of maybe even passengers mm. do you ever get that uh, I think it would be different if I was purely operationally based. Okay. If I was out in the terminals all the time. Yeah. Because I'm back office, not as much. But 
I get the buzz when you're walking through a terminal building. Yeah. Like there's a real buzz when you're walking through like the International Departure Lounge. My favorite game is just to stand in front of one of those screens and just pick a pick of where I want to go. Like <laughs> if I could jump on any plane right now, it's like you're sitting there. It's like you got Tokyo, you oh. got Bali, you got Australia. It's like just, they're all just lined up New York, Dubai you know peru yeah and it's just all the options are right there and you're thinking you're constantly watching people go to their like dream destination yeah. and you're just there like yeah standing on the side of the runway watching planes take off and obviously you know where it's going because it, yep. it says it on there and you're kind of like wow there's like 300 people on there that are about to land in the most beautiful weather it's, you know shorts beaches just food ah oh, and you, know, yeah. you just watch them go yeah. it's there in the rain and they and they <laughs> and they've not given a single thought to how they've actually been able to get on that yeah, flight on time exactly and, and there's a whole and army of people it's not me it's there's a whole it's army all, of people it's all, no, it's all you. there's an army of people yeah <laughs> 75,000 people work at Heathrow airport how many 75,000 people 75,000 people that's the population of reading work at the airport no yeah no <laughs> yeah i don't know how it could... how does that work i mean there's five terminals right uh four terminals technically terminal the terminal one is shut down oh so, yeah, yeah, so yeah yeah so terminal two three four and five okay, yeah but thing is the terminals are not even everything like there's stuff underground there's stuff off-site there's stuff really everywhere like you have just there's if you it's like to break down every level there's yeah people on every level doing something do you know what that they, i, I kind of relate that to an f1 team mm -hmm. how you have mm -hmm. the driver mm -hmm. the i guess the people in the in the pit lane yep. people on the yeah doing all that and then you've got the people back at home exactly in the office doing all the Day operational analysis. The, exactly. the analysis yeah exactly fair, fair enough okay well, that's a lot of people it's a lot of people that's that's actually that's actually insane yeah that's insane Seventy five thousand people this is pre-covid numbers but still 75 where we're building back up to that yeah. now and if you think about it um you know we get i i think let me just make sure i get the numbers right we, the amount of planes that come out in and out of air, heathrow airport every single day 1200 aircraft movements per day landing and taking yes. off. yes so if you were to combine landings and takeoffs air, an aircraft movement wow. is either a landing or a takeoff yeah 1200 aircraft movements per day that's every 45 seconds. So when you, we, we open at like four, five thirty six in the morning, yeah. you'll see a queue of planes in the sky really? waiting to land. And then there's a queue of planes on the ground waiting to take off. So the runways are constantly getting hammered. And I can imagine if there's the tiniest delay, I don't know, maybe there's ways around delays. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can explain, but I would imagine if there's like a tiny delay, 10, 15 minutes here, it can just grow and grow and grow. And it has such a, knock on effect 100 percent. are there 100%. ways at heathrow that you navigate around a delay yeah to make sure flights are on time 100 percent. so the thing is the root cause of a delay could be anything yeah right so what that means is that we need to think of all these particular scenarios that might cause a delay and think about redundancies and think about contingencies so that there's always a backup Mm. If something goes wrong, what is your backup? Is mm. the all, the main question at an airport is what's your resilience? Yeah. What's your redundancy? If the electricity was to switch up, what's your backup? If uh, the the screens were not stop working, what's your backup? If you were to get uh, a water blockage in one of your pipes, what's your backup? Mm. If you were to get the lights on the runway to switch up, what's your backup? If, if somebody was off sick, what's your backup? Mm. Every single thing you can imagine. If the food didn't arrive on time, what's your backup? Yeah. Everything needs a backup. Why? Because think of it as dominoes that are all stacked up nice and perfectly. The most important thing is that when that backup, when that domino starts to fall, there's a backup that goes, nope. Something stops it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the moment it falls, it goes, the whole airport shuts down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So to, to like, to, to put some of, some of it, I guess, into perspective, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share this, but like, you know, when it snowed quite heavily a couple of years ago, right? Even recently. Yeah. Recently we're, we're fine, but 2018. I think, no, do I talk about 2009? Like throw it oh, all the way oh, back, oh, right? Okay. 2009, 2012, we got these really, really heavy snowstorms mm. in, in, in the UK. Um, and, and something that I was told, this is a story that I was told, is that the people who were scraping the snow didn't really know where to put all this snow, right? There's so much snow, where do we put it? So they just chose a corner and they were like, we'll just dump it here. Yeah. And they dumped all the snow in that one corner. And you know what happens to snow when it sets? 
turns into a big mountain of ice. It does. Now, what happened was, apparently, what they had blocked was the place where the baggage, little, do you know those little baggage, the things that pull the bags around yeah. to take them from the terminal to yeah. the plane? That's where they used to refuel. So they blocked the refueling area for these baggage trolleys, which meant that while they were trying to do a favor to clear the snow, yeah. now that there's no snow, they can't refuel. And that had a massive knock-on effect, which had a knock-on effect. Yeah. So can you see how everything, yeah. especially at Heathrow Airport, everything is so intertwined because we're, we're, such a, we're in a small, very small space. Mm. We're about five square miles mm. and there's a lot going on in yeah. a very, very small space, yeah. which means that everything needs to be thought through so meticulously to make sure that these mistakes don't happen. So after that was identified as an issue back, back then, luckily they were able to, to overcome that as an issue, they were able to do something mm. to clear that snow to get um, mm. to get the the refueling back on back online. But what happened was, is they were like, okay, if it snows again, like that heavily, what's the plan? Yeah. So a whole team emerged. A whole team was created. Snow experts, literally, they're called yeah. the snow team. And really, <laughs> they're 12, 12 months a year. They are preparing for the day that it might snow. And we have a whole team of people who are on backup, who are on, who are on uh, what we call IRT, mm. which is instant response. Yeah. So within, they get a call within 90 minutes, they have to be at the airport. Wow. 30 minutes, sorry. Within 30 minutes, they have to be at the airport ready to go. Um, and there's a whole team of people who are just sat there on snow watch, just making sure that if it starts to snow, we're ready to, yeah. to engage that plan. Yeah. So every mistake that happens, instantly an investigation pop, it pops up. Yeah. And that investigation puts in something that makes sure it doesn't happen again. And I guess that's why Heathrow most times does work so well. I don't, I don't think I've had any time where I've had a delay. I don't think. Um, but I go to the US and it's like, it's just a standard thing over there. Yeah. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> this is like four hour delay. It's like, oh, fine. Um, <laughs> just another day. It's just another day in the US uh, airport. Yeah, one of them. Um very interesting. Mm. And I guess they would have had to call in those people, the IRT team. Yep. Oh, IRT, no, the IRT yeah. team. IRT, yep. IR team. Um, <laughs> uh, two weeks ago, right? Yeah. Because it yeah, snowed yeah. and they would have had to deal with it. So very interesting. Good to know. There you go. Now you know. Very There's an army of people yeah. just to make sure that you can go. Meow. But I also, <laughs> there must be an army of people. Well, there is for luggage. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so when you hear stories in the news or you know wherever some people lose their luggage mm -hmm. or a dog recently was sent to Saudi Arabia in uh, I think I think it was a US couple and the dog just ended up in Saudi really yeah uh -oh. so it's like I'm like how does that happen how does luggage go missing how does luggage some luggage get stolen that's an interesting thing as well have you got anything to share about that how that could happen so i mean the the whole baggage system is like cctv up oh yeah to the brink yeah like really really okay. heavy heavy security so i don't understand how that stuff happens because i mean i look around i'm like i wouldn't maybe it's not london heathrow yeah but, that's the thing so heathrow yeah. is very secure in that yeah, sense yeah. and the people who are allowed to access those areas have all been screened because like, an additional type of screening yeah which means that you're allowed to enter baggage areas so on everyone's pass like mm. the blue passes there's an additional B, which stands for baggage. Okay. If you don't have that B on your pass, you're not you allowed in the baggage in. area. So there's additional checks of who gets in. There's always security yeah. to make sure that things aren't there. How do bags go missing? There are a million and one reasons yeah? why a bag might go missing. Okay. There are so many different things that could go wrong. It's like, honestly, there's so many different things that could happen. Okay. You know, the thing that just popped into my mind, like the closest thing to it is like, you know, like child labor. Yeah. Or like childbirth, right? The formation of a child. Mm. There are a million things that could go wrong, but 99.99% of people make it yeah. without any issues. Yeah, okay. right? It's like a miracle. Yeah. With the baggage system, 99.99% bag of bags make it through without a problem. But there's that 1% where issues happen. And yeah. it could be that, uh, like, for example, there are, okay, here's, okay, top tips. Yeah. If you're flying through an airport, don't put bags with this sort of stuff into the system because it will jam and you probably won't get it again. If you have, if you're a traveler and you have those rucksacks, yeah, okay, you know those big rucksacks, oh. okay, that that you can fill up with loads of stuff, yeah, those straps will get caught on something, interesting, and they will cause delays and they will probably get shredded because the belt is just going to go. Because <laughs> so imagine this, right? Your rucksacks strap, 
gets caught in a, like a metal thing that, yeah. while it's going past. Now it's it's jammed yeah. and the thing underneath it just keeps rolling and it's yeah. shredding the thing underneath it. Yeah. And another bag comes, comes behind back. it and yeah, lodges yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then now you've got a stack up of bags that are trying to push past this bag, okay. which is which is sort of hanging on for dear life. Mm. It's not going to be a nice day. Okay. You're going to arrive to Thailand for your backpacking holiday <laughs> with a shredded <laughs> bag and you're not going to have a good time. So if you are going to send one of those bags on, make sure that your straps are all tied down, yeah. carry extra elastic bands, make sure that all of the yeah, extra yeah, straps yeah. are all wrapped. Make sure there's no anything loose, any mm. loose things that might get caught, eliminate those. So that's number one. Number two, if you have one of those duffel bags, uh, that's like... And if you get it shrink wrapped at the airport, what it turns into is basically a ball. Oh. Now imagine an incline, imagine like an inclined oh, yeah. conveyor belt. And then you have one of these balls on there. It literally just sits there and just goes rolls Funny. and rolls and rolls for as long as it takes until another bag comes behind it and goes and, whack. Yeah. And then it pushes it. And now when that happened, the system's like, I don't know where this bag is. Because mm. what the system does is it tracks a space on the conveyor belt in imagi an imaginary space. Got it. Now, the moment it rolled out of that space, it's like, hold on a minute, where's this bag? Mm. So then it has to scan it again. It has to then identify, okay, there's this bag that's appeared. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It has to send it to a different place. It has to get scanned again, re-entered back into the system, and then sent back around again which adds precious minutes onto your bag, making it or not making it. Bags can go on little adventures mm. because of stuff like this because it, it doesn't know which, which bag it is <laughs> yeah. anymore. So if you're going to, if you're going to have a bag that is in any way, shape or form circular, yeah. like just be warned. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah. it's not a great idea because there's inclined conveyor belts. Yeah. I've seen a trunky, go down a slope in the baggage system at probably like 15, 20 miles an hour, <laughs> hit, the, hit the edge, <laughs> hit the edge and just go flying through <laughs> the air. Don't check your trunkies. Let, trunkies oh. are designed for kids to sit on in the terminal, not to go through a baggage Don't system. Don't check them in, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't check in a trunky because your baby's going to be so yeah, disappointed yeah, yeah, yeah. when their trunky <laughs> wheels are broken. But it's because there's inclines, there's declines. It's a really complex system. Yeah. And then it's designed for a standard rectangular bag. Okay. Anything that sits outside that goes a bit funky okay. and then it causes lots and lots of de delays and knock-on effects. So rectangular and the grippiest yes. of materials. Yes. Apply double-sided sticky tape. <laughs> okay, don't do Just, that. No, no, don't, don't, don't do that. It's bad advice. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Those are three things to avoid. Yeah. Avoid sending your bags with their straps. Yeah. Avoid sending any round bags. Yeah. And don't send your babies trunky. No trunkies. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Very funny. Um, it's interesting though how you talk about like one thing can create such a domino effect in delays. Um, yeah. Very, very interesting. I think um, of all the issues people have, I would imagine luggage is probably the biggest one. Delays of the flights is another. Um, security as well. Do you have any involvement with getting through security? Mm -hmm. Because for me, that is the most annoying part of my life. <laughs> Not because of the process, yeah. but well, maybe it is, but it's because of how incompetent the people are in front of me because they don't have their laptop out ready. Mm. They're too slow. They're not doing the, putting the trays on and it's just like, just hurry up. And it's the, it is, it's the worst time of my life at that point. Um, are you involved in any of that? Uh, what I'd say is just breathe. <laughs> just Thanks, man. I, I know, I know, but just, just take, just, just take. watch them struggle and take a nice, big, deep breath and a smile it. and just enjoy it. I know. Just enjoy them <sighs> struggling. <laughs> with their, with their... It's not that easy, though. Yeah, I know. It's not that easy. Um, yeah, I, for anybody who's, you know, somebody once told me, it's like, bro, can you please make TikTok videos to, to educate these people? Because especially after COVID, everyone's now going back on traveling and they haven't done it for two years. Yeah. They're like, oh my God, like, how do I do I've got this? these liquids. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> and he's like, can you make TikTok videos to educate them? I'm like, oh, I can't bother. I don't really, I wanna, don't want to do like that's some boring videos. I'd rather educate about how X-ray machine works. Yeah, the, you then, do you do way more interesting videos. That would yeah. be quite a boring one. Yeah, but, but it would probably do well. <laughs> but if it educates the world on how to get through quicker, then... Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Guess what? Go on. Great news. The new generation of X-ray machines yeah. are basically CT scanners. Oh. The stuff they use in hospitals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which means you don't have to take out liquids. 
<gasps> don't have to take out your laptops. No. Basically, things can just fly through. When? Next few years, you're going to be seeing them popping up. Uh, so the Department for Transport has released a brand new sort of bit of legislation. It's public news. If you travel through Terminal 2 at Heathrow Airport, we have a trial one. Currently. Do you? Yeah, yeah. We're, so we're currently trialing it. We're training our staff on it. Oh. Um, and also, there's no more of this anymore. No more standing here, getting like the... that. And then it goes, and then there's that yeah. thing goes... Vroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's more like there's these two metal things that you okay. stand in between. Do that. Yeah. You put your hands out like this. Yeah. For like a split second, then it just goes... And then it can... So it's a lot faster. Brilliant. So we are... We are... I say we... There is a team at the yeah, airport yeah. who's investing massively into this change program. But within the next few years, you won't have to take out your liquids. You won't have to take out your laptops. It will be basically what this thing can do, this CT scanner, yeah. is it can basically take a look inside your bag in such detail that the person sitting there can be like, yeah, yeah I can see everything. Yeah, yeah. And then they, it's, just, awesome. it's just easier for them. They don't have to have the liquid separate and the laptop separate. Yeah. It's just the visual effects on it are amazing. Yeah. To the point where the technology is so good. Brilliant. It can just scan, it can go straight through. Honestly, brilliant. Because on the other side of things, when you land and you have to go through the the border security where you have yeah. to scan, we can scan our passports electronically now. Exactly. And that is, that's great that's because great. you can get through super, super quick unless there's a, an issue and you've got to join that other queue, which can happen. I've never had that. Have you ever had that? I didn't the other day, but the person I was traveling with did, and it took them an hour to get through. Ouch. So it did affect me. Ouch. I'm just, I'm just not a nice person in an airport. <laughs> I need I, everyone goes into airport <laughs> mode. <laughs> honest, <laughs> on, honestly, um, so I, I, I did uh, feel the pain, um, but feel the pain, feel the pain. <laughs> so that's good though. So going in, coming back, it's all going to be smoother. My job at the airport is literally to make sure that from the moment you step off whatever transport you've arrived at the airport with, up until the moment you get onto that plane, you have the most smooth, relaxing, efficient journey. And it's just pleasant yeah. through and through. Not only pleasant, but maybe enjoyable. Yeah. Right? People usually have a stressful time at the airport. That's what typically people think about. Yeah, yeah. Where's my passport? Where's my ticket? Am I going to get on the flight? Do yeah. I have extra weight? All of these things come to mind, but actually as an engineer, my job is like, okay, how can I make sure this thing works as smoothly as possible so that yeah. actually the holiday starts now? Yes. Yeah. Enjoy your, enjoy your pint or whatever you're doing in the restaurant and just, just relax. But yeah. or um, orange juice, orange juice. I was going to say, I, I never, I, I, do you know what? I look at people <laughs> that have a pint. I'm like, it's 8 a.m. What are you doing? <laughs> airport mode. <laughs> yeah, airplane mode. Air, airport mode. It's like, yeah, it is. And I'm like, well, but. How are you doing that? A lot of people do that for tradition, I think. I don't really drink myself, so I'm kind of like, that just sounds, yeah. yeah. Not, not, Me neither, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I'm that just, Muslim lifestyle. Just. I was going to say, you probably don't anyway, but um, yeah, I yeah, find it quite bizarre. Sorry to any listeners or watchers that have that as a tradition that you have a, a pint at the airport. With the family, just everyone's just... Yeah, in uh, in one of the... Do you have a weather... Is it a weather yeah, screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah <laughs> it is what it is, isn't it? I was on that, I was on a plane the other day when I was I was going to... I was, I was going to Toronto mm -hmm. and I messaged you and I was like, yo, I'm in T4. Let me know if you're free. You probably... You were doing something. Um, so I actually, I actually sat on the plane before we took off for a good hour. Mm -hmm. And... I think the pilot probably did give updates and this might be absolutely nothing to do with you, but I imagine it probably is in some way. Um, why, why would we sit there? Even if we've, we've pulled, we've been pushed out yep. and we're almost ready. Yeah. I kind of think in that hour period, so many planes would have had to come, go, come, go. Like surely the queue isn't that big. Mm -hmm. What could have happened? It depends on what stage of the pushback you were at. Right. Yeah. Were you, like if you were still on the stand so mm. then let's let's start from from the roots right yeah, yeah, yeah potentially um you could be on the plane and you're thinking all right why aren't we getting even pushed back like you're still standing at the gate yeah potentially the air bridge so that that metal square pipe that you walk that you through walk to across. get onto yeah. that could be stuck no right yeah that's so, so it's annoying like, <laughs> so it's like we can't move this plane because this thing is stuck that's so annoying right so that that could be an issue okay. so until they get that thing off it's like okay well we can't move back the next thing is like now that that's free okay well we're ready to go 
potentially the, the aircrafts have this thing at the back of them called an APU. Okay. Or so, well, okay. Once I'll give you this, to put this into perspective, I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, once an Emirates A380 had a very similar situation. Yeah. The, the air bridge has been removed. Yeah. Everything's ready to go or it seems. And actually one of the engines isn't starting. Why? Because the auxiliary power unit, that, that thing at the back, the electrical mm. system, hasn't got enough power, isn't generating enough power to be able to start the engine, which meant we had to manually start the engine, which take it's a process, right? And what mm. that means is you have to literally fire up that engine 100% on stand with the brakes on, um, and not go flying into the tower yeah, in front of you. Yeah. Um, so I was watching these engineers that were firing up this engine, and that was a, that was a very meticulous process. Mm. Um, uh, probably the, the 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 pilot would have given you updates if that was happening because yeah. you'll hear it. Yeah, like, sure, sure, sure. You know, yeah. there's a full very engine. Very scary if you yeah. didn't, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. so there's a full engine yeah, about yeah, to whirl yeah, up yeah, yeah. and you're just standing <laughs> there. So there's there's something like that that could happen. Uh, potentially they can't, They maybe they're understaffed and they actually can't find the staff to be pushing back your plane. Really? So okay. there's, there's yeah. some, maybe they're moving other planes or other planes that have been sat in the queue yeah. before you and they need to go do those before, before your plane yeah. does. Maybe they're actually... There's planes uh, now. Now, now that you've said okay, we're ready to go. Yeah, they'll be like, great. But there's a person who said they were twenty minutes. They were t- ready to go twenty minutes ago. Mm. So we need to get them out first. Yeah, I get it. I get before it. you go. So there's just so many. Even when you're on, when you've pushed back finally, yeah, and you're going towards the uh, the uh, to get to mm. to fly. I've seen pictures where there's literally seven or eight planes in a queue, okay, waiting to use that runway. So there's only one runway for takeoffs. Yeah, yeah. Which means that every plane that needs to take off has to wait for that. Yeah. Now, waiting to get into that plane, there's a lot of things that need to be considered. If you have a really, really big plane, once it takes off, it leaves behind so much turbulence, so much air movement mm. that a small plane can't take off after them. They have to wait two or three minutes for the air to settle before a smaller plane can go. Okay. All they can do is they can stagger them. So let's say I knew I, if I was an air traffic controller and I knew I had to send off this big old A380, I know that after I send that off, I have to wait a few minutes if I want to send any more smaller planes. Mm. So what I'll do is I'll get all the smaller planes to go first and I'll tell the A380 to stand ah, there. Okay. So you might be standing on A380 going, where, why, yeah. are we, why are we flying? It's because you're in a massive plane. Yeah. And what the air traffic controller is trying to do yeah. is trying to send all the small planes first yeah. because they're not going to make so much turbulence in the air. And then when they send you off, mm. they can follow on with the bigger planes. Yeah. So there's just so much that happens yeah. that, that has to be considered. I can't tell you why you sat there for an hour, but mm. could have been a, it could have been three of those things that I said all at once. Like maybe you're really unlucky, and all three of those things that I mentioned yeah. were happening to your plane at, at one point. I suppose it could be, could be probably hundreds or that. It, it could be anything, right? Literally, it could be anything. Yeah, take it's, a pick. <laughs> it's just, it's just so quick to just be a bit like, "Fuck's sake, what's going on?" Yeah, like oh my God. And you get so agitated. And another thing is, like, I sat there for an hour. I have a strategy. Every time I fly, mm-hmm. I will always be the last person onto the plane. Yeah. And you probably know this. Of course. But I see people queuing at the gate and I'm like, what What are you doing? Yeah, you're just going to sit there and just see. You're going to sit there another 30, 45 minutes longer than I am. The plane isn't leaving without us and without me. <laughs> I will be the last person. Without me. <laughs> without me. Guys, I'm the king of this plane. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I, so I, I I wait and I'm the last person to show my passport and my boarding pass and I get on last. Yes, I might struggle to find a place to put my bag because everyone else has done it before me. That's probably what they're there for because they know they've got so much stuff they need probably. to Probably. But also I do think that maybe people don't even think why they're in the queue to get yeah. on the plane. That it's just the plane needs to go. Let's go, let's go, it's, let's go. It's, 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 queues work for some things, but for a plane that needs to get everyone on, for then it to leave, it, it, it doesn't, it baffles me. Another thing that baffles me as well is as soon as the plane lands and, and you stop, everyone jumps up and they're just stood there <laughs> like this. They've got their bag, they're ready to go. And again, I'm just sat there like, until people go off the plane, like we can't go anywhere. I'm not moving. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. So I have a video on my page. I think it's one of the first videos on there, which is like, here's what's happening outside the plane. We might everyone is standing on the inside. Oh yeah. Like, that's the intro to the video. It's like everyone's standing on this Everyone plane right now. And, like, and this is what's happening outside. This is why you're not moving anywhere. What, what, what is, it's the, the So the it's bridge. me showing that the air bridges are coming on. Yeah. We're plugging in this from the bottom. Yeah. We're unloading this cargo from there. We're doing this over there. All this action's happening outside here. Meanwhile, everyone's there going, 
Why aren't we going? Yeah. Why aren't we moving? Just, just sit, guys, just sit down. Yeah. Just take it easy. Mm-hmm. Let the front of the people get off the exactly. plane and then stand up. And... Yeah. <sighs> it's that behind the scenes access that I want to give people on my page. It's that access to say, let me show you what's happening. What all these little frustration niggles that you might have. If I educate you about them, maybe you'll be more accepting. And actually, yeah. you know what's funny now that I've said that? I remember being part of the baggage team. So when I joined the graduate scheme, mm. I got a chance to go around to all the different departments. Yeah. And one of the things that I was talking to one of the managers about, she's like, people are so quick to jump to conclusions about the baggage system. Mm. Like, and like, if anything goes wrong, it's just dead straight away. Yep. It's your problem. How yep. could you do this? The thing is, is that with the baggage system, the expectation is that 100% of the bags arrive. Yeah. There's no... And I kind of want to say like rightly so because no one's bag should go missing. But as we all know, and we all have... Well, some of us have common sense and we know that things just don't go the way that you want. And when you're working with like an Amazon-like warehouse system of movement, Mm -hmm. you know, all these moving parts, um, things are going to go wrong. Exactly. So it's that understanding that this thing is really complicated. Yeah. That gives you that, ah, oh, okay, well, I can understand if why something didn't go to plan. Yeah. But if you just think it's a black hole that then will just, oh, and your bag arrives on the other side and it's magic. Yeah. And you've never even thought twice about how your bag goes from there to there. Then you're going to expect 100% because you have no knowledge about I'd, it. I'd love for you to ask someone, how does your, how did your bag, give me the process of how your bag got to New York today. They'd be like, uh, it went on the conveyor thing and someone picked it up and put it on the plane. I, be- yeah. <laughs> I bet there's one, two, three, three or four maybe processes that they can think of. But yeah. actually, I'd love maybe like a GoPro to be, probably wouldn't work. But you know what really, I mean? I've got footage of GoPro. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, not mine, but they've got, I've got some. <laughs> I'd love to see yeah, yeah. an A to B yeah. of somebody's uh, suitcase. Yeah, yeah, that so exists. Cool. That exists. So cool. I actually really like the idea of like, how do you think your bag got here? Like right? a little intro to a YouTube video. I bet, I bet, I bet some people have no idea. And yeah. being honest, I've not really given it much thought. I see people put luggage in those big, like what they call like the steel things yep. or like yep. it'll get driven in like a... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see that. I see them yeah. load it. Sometimes. I love how you're struggling with the names. I could give you the that names. That steel <laughs> wheel thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Just keep trying. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep, keep trying. Uh, but yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Very very interesting. Yeah. Are you um, are you afraid of flying? Are you okay with flying in general? Mate, I love flying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to fly more. I mean, I I'm a skydiver. I have a skydiving oh, yeah? license. Yeah, wow. I've flown planes before. My goal is to get one of those gravity suit jetpacks. I'm not sure if you've seen them. I have. It's like, like the four rockets sh- on the seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they just, go, yeah. and they just go fly. That's, that's where I see my life going. Okay. If I had to choose. <laughs> and like, I'd have like a little flying car at one point in my life. Some point when wow. I, like, I really, the reason why I remember choosing aerospace was I had this view of a utopian future mm. where everything's flying. That and, is the image people would give, yeah. And yeah. I and I wanted to be a part of that. Cool. So I was like, one day everything's gonna be flying, and that would be really cool. And I don't want to miss out on that. Mm. I'd love to be a part of that. So I was like, I'll just do aerospace because I had this vision of like, zoom, zoom, like yeah, yeah. You know, these like utopian cities. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's gonna need a whole bunch of engineers and like people to think about that sort of stuff and how it works. And the craziest thing is, is that now that I'm here, I was at the Farnborough Air Show probably about six months ago, mm. and I saw like flying cars like i saw designs of like flying cars and i was speaking to engineers who are working on flying cars really and i'm yeah like there's a there's so many uk based companies that are designing flying cars working yes examples. working prototypes of flying wow. cars within the next 10 15 20 years this stuff is going to be emerging like probably even less than that mm. like the gravity jetpacks are they are finding use cases for it okay. they're putting it to work you see a, there's videos of an actual human being yeah. flying like Iron Man, yeah, like seen, an actual thing. Like, yeah. And it's not even like a nuanced thing anymore. These things are happening. Yeah. Give it a and couple it of years. And it doesn't look clunky either. It no, looks it's smooth. Sp- yeah. yeah. Reliable, yeah. smooth. Yeah. Like, think about that. Think about when TVs were introduced to society. For the first time, there was yeah. this thing called a screen. Yeah. And now look at us. Yeah, I know. Where we've all got screens in our pockets and screens on our wrists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, think about how quickly technology emerges. Mm. Like, think about, like, AI that's just popped up, like that chat 
GPT. Mm. Like, mm. think about how quickly the world is moving mm. now. That's an exciting place to be. I personally, the reason why I do all this TikTok and Instagram yeah. stuff is I want to document that. Like, when how when the world yeah. starts to fly, I want to be the you guy. Be, you want to be the first to... To just te- to just show the world what's coming. Yeah. Like, imagine, like, Top Gear. Yeah. But for the aviation industry. Sick. You're gonna, have, dude, you're gonna have your own TV show. That would swear, be sick. <laughs> swear you will. Um, that's what I'm working towards personally. Speaking about technology and the rate of progression of it, mm-hmm. in particular within aviation, what what came to my mind then was a guy called Bob Lazar. Okay. Have you ever heard of him? No. Tell me about So him. Bob Lazar worked at, I think I probably might get it, I probably will get this wrong. Worked at Area 51 okay. and worked at the military base and worked on spacecrafts that were using they were it was getting power from a source that we hadn't been able to identify before Mm. and it was like this anti-gravity ufo looking spaceship that the u.s found and um i guess the power the the fuel and what made the spaceship move was just this he described it as this ball of energy that when you turn it on it acted as um i don't know the right words because i'm not in your field but acted as like a propellant anti-gravity kind of force nice um so i'd advise you check that out yeah bob lazar bob lazar i'll send you the link but he was on the joe rogan podcast you probably heard of him nice and he he talks about this and area area 51 is like this yeah super you know discreet secret was anyway um, but he, he, he talked about all this stuff. Nobody believed him at the time. He was like, oh, to get in, we had to use fingerprint scanners and it would know it was me by my fingerprints. And everyone was just like, what are you on about? Yeah. This technology doesn't exist. Yeah. What are you talking about? And then over the years now, everyone has kind of been like, oh yeah, it probably did exist in the military before it was this commercial thing. Exactly. And I think that probably happens quite a lot. Exactly. Maybe it's like secret military yep. technology that we use as maybe power over other countries i don't know yeah. but um, think about think about drones that's another good use case yeah like drones like drones have been used in the military since like the 80s yeah think about that i know like, it's interesting like it's been a long time it's we've been re- using drones it's really interesting Do you know what i mean it's, it's interesting how war drives technology big time massively it's crazy yeah war or i mean like the space race is a great yep. example right <laughs> if Just that happened competition i don't know if, I, do, I don't do you believe that we landed on the moon i do okay yeah sucker no, boring. <laughs> bit boring like, <laughs> no. what, what, comment down below. But, but this is that's a good topic though you you know a lot about how in the 60s yeah were we able to do that i mean here's the thing research the international space station right yeah there's this thing that's orbiting the world yeah. right now, yeah, yeah. right? And like we're, we're literally orbiting the world every mm. every hour, every 90 minutes, there's this thing that's orbiting the world. Yeah. And this thing was assembled during like the 70s, man. And it's still mm. up there till this day. And we get like, we can literally live track it across yeah. the sky, which I have done. Yeah. I've watched YouTube videos from in there of astronauts doing stuff. And yeah. you start to realize that, hold on a minute, like stuff was quite advanced. And actually, I think this, I think they were a lot more resourceful back then. Okay. Like, we don't need so much technology. Mm. We overcomplicate things. It's true. They were just very resourceful with what they had. The engineers back then were super, super. It's like, I'm going to give an example, right? My mom is the best chef. Like, she's an amazing yeah. cook. She can use all right? the different ingredients to. But she's very resourceful. Yeah. yeah. Like, my mom can take, like, a. a, a like a takeaway over like something yeah, yeah, that stayed yeah. there from yesterday, uh, whatever, like whatever she finds in the, in the, in, in the fridge, in the fridge, put it there, put it there. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah. And she's able to make the most amazing dish that I, like I haven't even tasted food like that in a restaurant. Yeah. Even though the restaurant has everything they need. It's true. But when you're resourceful, yeah, you can create things that are so amazing yeah. that people with all the ingredients in the world wouldn't be able to make. Yeah. And I think that's what the engineers of the past were. They were just extremely resourceful. Yeah. That's how they were able to do things that right now we're thinking, how do you do that? Yeah. And I guess it wasn't that long ago. But when you do look at the technology from back then, like a computer back then was like mm. the size of a house, <laughs> like or the size of a car. Yeah. It was it was a big machine. It was this yeah. big thing. And I I can understand that we can get like a, a satellite or something to orbit Earth. 
but to actually go past that through all the different radiation zones, land on the moon, have a good time there, <laughs> get back on, come back. I'm just yeah. like, it's yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, wow. If if that happened back then, the the only thing that gives me a bit of disbelief is the fact that it was this political race and, yes. it, and it was there was motivation perhaps to yeah, yeah. Um, and i'm like i don't trust it the media in the best of days and that's the thing but and people say oh why haven't we gone back it's like well, well yeah. apparently we are apparently apparently is it china some apparently a few countries yeah. maybe the uae and yeah uh nasa all combined i love how to, this time is a team effort <laughs> yeah it's just <laughs> like, like yeah but this is the thing it's like yeah how did the US do it? On I think it's own? a budget thing. It's like, yeah, we don't want to spend all that money on ourselves. Yeah. Do you want to help? <laughs> Pro prob probs. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, so you're you're not you you love flying. You're not not afraid of flying. I love flying. Um, my my mum's been on a plane and one of the engines failed, which you would think it would just crash, but apparently no. Nope. Um, if you've some have two engines, some have four. Yep. So if if a two engine plane, if one of the engines on a two engine plane dies crashes out it can still yeah survive with the one but it will always try and find the nearest place to land oh, and really? that's that that's that redundancy thing we we're talking about so sure, that sure. domino was about to fall and you're able to keep it up just but if that fell then yeah it's going down my mum my is terrified of flying really because of that okay she was fine but because of that and also she was i don't know why but she was involved in the lockerbie crash i don't know if you know about this but maybe after this check check it out the, there was a lockerbie crash and she had to go on site and witness it all damn what so was she I, doing back then i actually don't know i think she was in a corporate office job yeah but for some reason had to be on site and she just remembers obviously the site the the, the literal site of it and the smells of like human flesh Jeffy and all that, yeah. and, and that mixed in, and mm. I think that scarred her. Bless yeah, her. That's um, traumatic. Very. Um, have you worked at Heathrow, and there's been a crash? No. Wow. Two thousand and eight was the last crash. Well, there's been a crash, but it's only so it a crash. Okay. While while I've been at Heathrow Airport, we have had a crash, but I I, I think crash is too dramatic. Okay. To describe what actually happened. Uh, there was one plane parking up and it hadn't completed its parking cycle yet, but the pilot had stopped. Yeah. So if you imagine it, it's like he'd gone in yeah. to the stand or she, I'm not sure if it was a guy or a girl driving it, but they hadn't got to where they should have stopped for that plane size. Mm -hmm. And then another plane passed from behind it, but the tail was still sticking out into the middle of... The, so what happened was is one wing and one tail collided Oof. so it was more like an aircraft collision was on a crash was the plane taking off or landing no 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 no. it wasn't they were just they were just they were just slowly meandering around oh. the airfield that's what i'm saying oh like, so the wing of the, the the wing of the plane it wasn't as if it was like no man it was like it was like been... it was like moving at like five miles an hour <laughs> like, oh okay that's what i'm saying it's too dramatic so was it like crash. a little tap or was it like a crunch and a fall off wink, wink nothing fell off but okay. it was a bit of a crunch and oh that that's so bad people had to get off yeah well the luckily the people had just arrived they were, they were, they were sweet <laughs> they just came off the plane yeah um and i think the other plane was just about to take off oh, so their holiday got ruined doesn't that'd be annoying yeah so while you've been there or no, did you say since 2008 there hasn't been a crash at Heathrow? like a major one that 2008 was the last yeah time so it was a beijing aircraft there was some there was some ice build up in the engine, which meant that as the planes were on its final approach, yeah. the pilot couldn't get any more power out of the engines, and it literally missed the road coming into the airport by literally a couple couple wow. couple hundred like couple not even hundred meters like I'd say probably like 50, 60 meters yeah. from the road, and it just missed the runway and it crash landed on the grass area. No fatalities. I was going to ask, was it a big crash? It fatalities was massive, injuries? man. It was massive. But there's no wow. fatalities, no injuries. The pilot's done an amazing job at just getting it across. Because yeah. they noticed there was a there was a failure sooner. Mm. And they just adjusted the wings, like the settings on the wings, just slightly mm. to make them like glide for longer. Yeah. And they were able to just get it over that, over that fence into yeah. the airport. 
and like crash land it on a grass area yeah. rather than having to crash land it on a, on a road or anything like that. Dude, I've seen too many videos of planes trying to land. Yeah. And it's like, like left to right, left yeah. to right. And I'm thinking these pilots are unreal, mm-hmm. like legit. And you've flown a plane before. You probably know how difficult it probably is. I don't know if it's a manual thing when it's super windy, but I think at some point they need to intervene. No, it's all, none of it. It's all autopilot. Oh, they do nothing. Oh, forget all that. Yeah. Oh, nah, forget all that. Uh, sorry to, sorry to oh, no. burst your bubble, but <laughs> auto, auto landing at airports is a thing. Is <laughs> like, it? Yeah. The pilots don't do anything. What? Do, okay. But when they're on autopilot in the sky, what, what do they do? Are they just there in case something goes wrong? Yes. But most of the times they will just lock on to something we call the ILS, the instrument landing system. Okay. And then the plane just lands itself. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry to disappoint. Pilots don't actually land the planes themselves. They just do auto landing. Because it feels sometimes like they're almost like yeah. fighting the wind or... Ah, it's just... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's also... I suppose... And like, here's yeah. the thing. If it's like really foggy and they can't see, they just put in auto landing as well. It's mad. <laughs> so then they don't even need to see where they're going. Uh, there are there are some points where they need to kind of have visuals yeah. for certain runways, but for Heathrow, because our our systems are so good, you literally do not need to even see where you're going. You can trust that the instrument landing system is so reliable wow. that you can just land your plane. It's crazy. Like a pilot will rarely intervene. Yeah, and I think they like to land on like a nice clear blue sky day where there's not much wind. They'll do it. Them they'll do it manually. Oh yeah. But from my experience of speaking to pilots, sure. they just use auto landing all the time. <laughs> so auto flying in the sky autopilot mm. auto landing when they're there the thing they actually do is they do the take t- do the takeoff they do the takeoff yeah which i guess isn't that difficult no really no just but it's a responsibility because they have to they have to actually vocalize like what they what speed they're doing and a decision to take off so they have to say something called v1 v2 yeah. which is like the velocities they're traveling at okay and if a pilot says um that they've decided to take off mm. that is a legally binding statement they have to take off so even if they've taken off and then something happens to the aircraft which they'd rather be on the ground for they're not allowed to now abort the takeoff wow. because there's not enough runway to stop okay so your brakes aren't strong enough to stop this plane for the end of the runway mm. so if you've committed to take off doesn't matter what happened it's about to happen to that plane you need to take off yeah because if you decide to not take off yeah you won't stop in time yeah so go around and come back would would, would i mean in a crash would, would the pilot lose their job like what what are yes yeah, like they have to take off they can't not take off like there'll be a massive investigation really if they say they're about to take off i think it's either v1 or v2 they say okay they say v1 they have to actually say it out loud there's a speaker that'll pick it up sure if they say it and then decide to abort landing mm. there'll be a massive massive consequence of that I find it fascinating how much trust the passengers put in the pilots and how much, well, how little thought is given to whether, yeah, whether we trust these people or not to take us eight hours to New York safely. Mm. And it's like, if I was sat in a car with someone, I'd be like, oh, they're a crap driver. I'm no way. Are they, I'm, a, I'm getting a car with them. And we know these people. It's like, I find it I find it odd that we would just get on a plane and someone just takes us. We don't know them. Mm. I mean, you get on a ship, I suppose, a train and go on a train, bus. get on a bus. Yeah, I don't know for some reason it's there's just a lot of trust. Seems more dangerous on a plane. I don't know yeah. why. I think it's actually more dangerous on a bus. Like yeah. they could just climb a curb and everything goes. Choop, yeah, just tip, and there's no seatbelts. There are there are there's no seatbelts on a bus. Have you ever, have you ever noticed that? That is a good point. That is a good point. <laughs> like this. so dangerous yeah and, and i've had some bus drivers that are whizzing through <laughs> like yeah they are speeding that is <laughs> a really fast. good point there's no seat belts on you just a have bus. to hold on why are there no seat belts on a bus well, why are buses exempt from safety <laughs> yeah well <laughs> it's not i don't say they're exempt from safety they just have different <laughs> different different standards for safety it's but yeah that's very... i think there's a lot of trust i think with pilots it's interesting here's a question for you yeah if you get on an aircraft um, and you know how the pilots announced who they are. Yeah. W- would y- would what you hear while they're speaking affect how you feel about them? So I'm going to give two scenarios here. Yeah. Three scenarios. Okay. You have white male, right? Mm. 
you have somebody who's from an ethnic minority background, male. Yeah. And a woman. Yeah. And the <laughs> last one is a woman. <laughs> Would that affect how you'd feel about that journey? Not at all. I, 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 I'm very aware of how difficult it is to become a pilot. Mm. Very, very aware. And I know that if they weren't capable, they would have been booted out. So not bothered. I am not Andrew Tate. I do not care <laughs> if it's a woman or someone else or a younger person. I, I, I yeah. do, doesn't bother me. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that it will for some people. Absolutely, it will. Hundred percent. It so really I, will. I have a I have a friend. She's called Michelle. She flies for EasyJet. Oh yeah. She's uh, a young, uh, mixed race woman, woman. <laughs> yeah fly and the she's, worst and kind she's, of pilot <laughs> no that she's sick <laughs> i know i know i know <laughs> but like you can imagine some people who yeah, have yeah, that yeah, perspective yeah, yeah. and it's thing is that she's the captain she's not even like the co-pilot mm. she's the captain of this aircraft right she is the top dog on yeah. that plane um and she the stories the stories she'll tell you of the racism really? and the so like just people just will get on a plane to see her there and like go ask for who's in charge she's like I can't believe that. <laughs> I am the captain. I, I'm, in, I'm in charge. <laughs> I am in charge. If you don't want to fly, get off. Actually, yeah. I can't get off. But yeah. Well, that's like, it's like, the thing is, it's like even like people who'd like not take her seriously when she gives them orders. Like, it's really, really like difficult to listen to her story sometimes because you're thinking she's been through so much to become a pilot, then to become a captain yeah. on board this aircraft. The chances then, are pretty slim. Yeah. Like, She's 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 earned those stripes. Definitely, literally, definitely, hundred percent. So, and it's tough. Like you hear her stories, and you really you, you think, wow, like things need to change. More needs to happen. It's a really good point. It is a really good point. But no, I mean personally, I I, I just think if if anyone's got some sort of common sense, they would they would know and they think about what actually has to happen for them to be in that position. Mm. But there are people who are still racist and um, sexist. Mm -hmm. um, which is terrible, but yeah, it happens. Um, yeah, very interesting. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else, anything interesting in the airport. Like, are there any are there any secrets to airports that people might want to know about? Are there any secret rooms that things happen and like? Uh, I can't explain. You probably couldn't even tell me anyway. <laughs> I, like, I had I had like four things pop into mind, and with each of them, it's so funny. Like, no, like I've it. been trained to like. Well, I've, I've been given enough insight yeah. and told how much power comes with this information Ooh. to the point where it's like, be careful yeah. what you put on the internet. Okay. Because if someone wants to know this yeah. in the wrong hands, it could be quite dangerous information. So these when you hands, ask a question like that. hands are dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So when you ask a question like that, I'm like, no, no. oh, I can think of like 15 interesting rooms <sighs> in the airport, but I can't mention any of them. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you about this? And feel free to absolutely shut me down. If there is a security threat, mm -hmm. possibly um, a terrorist alert, is there a process that would happen? What What would happen if someone, God forbid, did have something in their bag that was extremely dangerous? What would happen? There is a very meticulous, well thought through process that has been trialed off site on site yep. out of hours many times as to exactly how we would respond to a situation like that okay so there is a very and the thing is we train for this yeah as if it was real yeah so we don't tell people it's happened it's about to happen in the airport off it's so oh okay we right. have we have facilities sure um whether in or out of the airport can't say okay yeah sure, sure, sure there are facilities where we we create we replicate scenarios as if it was real as if it was real and okay. we 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 plan we we go live as if it's like mm. all mm. everything's about and it's like it's proper extreme like yeah one one thing just to put it into perspective like there's fake blood involved <laughs> like, weird, like actors. ketchup yeah, yeah, like, yeah, actors, yeah, yeah, yeah like it's a real and the reason why we do that is because you want to make sure everyone's on that mindset where it's as if it's real and then everything gets assessed everyone's move okay. gets assessed okay. was that the right move was that the wrong move how can we what training do we need to provide people mm. to make sure that they're in the right situation the reason why we do it isn't 
to make sure everything goes smoothly per se as much as it's how much can we learn from yeah. this situation yeah. you never want to be in a situation where this actually happens mm. but what you can do is you can replicate as yeah. if it were about to happen okay and then you can learn as much as you can so that if it was to ever happen yeah you'd be in the best possible scenario to deal sure. with that situation sure. um, and i think that just really goes to show like the meticulous level of of, of sort of how vigorous it is like the the secret services yeah. the police the yeah. fire engines the ambulances all hands on deck to make sure all the emergency services to make sure that you know god forbid if yeah. anything yeah, was yeah, yeah, to happen yeah, yeah. we are in the best possible position to respond one of my questions off the back of that w was is is there a bomb squad on site ready mm. or is it someone gets called and they'll come from somewhere no comment oh okay <laughs> Okay, <laughs> tasty. I'd imagine that there are certain people trained in that scenario that could probably respond. You know, like in a corporate office, you might have like a health and safety officer or a, um, what do you call them? A fire person that has like a little flag on the desk. I can imagine that some people are trained in that. You don't have to say yes or no, but that's um, it's good to know. It's very good to know. Yep, um, no comment. <laughs> fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Um but yeah, uh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to chat to you. Absolute pleasure to be here. I hope everyone listening, watching has, I guess, got some sort of value from it. I'm sure they have because it's been genuinely really, really interesting. Please do check out Mo's Insta, TikTok, YouTube, yep. all your socials. It'll mm -hmm. be in the description um, wherever you are watching and listening. Um, you won't be disappointed. Go give him a follow. Um, yeah for now i've got to say thank you once again thank you. and uh yeah we'll see you all soon bye, -bye.